welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God, you need God, but we need to go to the Word. So um, you can stay seated if you want, you can stand, you can, you can do anything you want except roll down the aisles. That just gives everybody a bad name. And uh, so, <laughs> just do it. I just play with you tonight. I don't know what's with me. This is a real serious message, and I'm out of it tonight. So, God, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, Father, we just love you. It's just so good to be in the house of God. It's good, Father, for the brethren to get together and with just the anointing of God to flow down on us. The world washes us with such grief and garbage, Lord, that it's just trash. We, you know, 25, 30 years ago, Lord, we used to watch television and listen to the news. Today, you can't. You're just so grossed out. And so, Father, this polluted society and world that we live in is just such a shame. All they needed was the Savior, Jesus, the hero of the world, the real, true, alive, forever hero of the world. And they've substituted it for everything else. And God, we love them. I know you love them. But here we are, Lord, your, your, your church. We're gathered together in this house, and we need the word of God to become alive for us tonight. And God, will give you the praise, give you the glory. Now, Lord, we want you to bless us. So we ask that the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher of the church, come and teach us. Not a man. We haven't come to hear from a man. Old man, young man, tall man, short man, brown man, white man, black man. We haven't come to hear from a woman. We've come to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. So welcome, Holy Spirit, in this house. As you bless us with the word of God this night, we would ask that you would bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet, that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're our brothers and our sisters, and we love them, Lord. At no time do we think of ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours. May all the praise and glory go to you in Jesus' mighty name. With a great big shout, we all say amen. amen. Well, go ahead and take your Bible, get your seat, have a seat. Throughout the years, the last couple of years, I've kind of, if you will, been mentioning, if you've been in church at all, you've heard me say this. The direction that you get your life on is the place you'll end up. Therefore, obtaining the pro proper direction is vitally important to how you live out your life. If you get the wrong directions in life and live out life the wrong way, everything in your life is going to eventually fail. Families will fail, and society and social systems will fail. Everything is going to fail because you're in the wrong place following the wrong directions. If we come and we find out, and I've said this for at least two years, we kind of find out how the Word of God has to say, what the Word says, and we get our directions instead of from society or social system, instead of from the economy, instead of whether or not our politicians tell us the right things or the wrong things or make plans for us or whatever the Supreme Court has to say, but we follow the Word of God we find ourselves, number one, very safe. And we find ourselves, number two, God backing us. And we find ourselves, most importantly, number three, with the proper directions so that we can end up in the right place, doing the right things, getting the blessings of the Lord. Wow, now that in itself is mind-boggling. And for the last couple of years, I always get on these certain kind of kicks and if you've been around any more than a couple of years, there's certain things. There was something years ago where we were all uh, full-time ministers, and we did that for about a year and a half, two. Then we went to some other subjects. And this has been about direction for the last couple of years. Uh, you could say I beat it to death, but I don't. I beat it to life. And there's such a difference between beating something to death and beating something to life. In the Word of God, there's two kinds of knowledge that you as a believer 
should have. One is the word gnosis. The word gnosis is an interesting word. It means that you have knowledge of something and you have understanding of it and you understand and know how it basically works and functions. You know of it. That's what you get if you go to school and you get an education and you know you take your test and then four months later you forgot everything you learned and if you took the test four months from now you probably wouldn't remember 50% of what you said. That's called gnosis. But in the scripture, God is desiring for you to have something called epinosis. Epinosis is a knowledge that becomes alive on the inside of you and becomes part of your thinking. If I said it becomes second nature, it wouldn't give God the right formula because it isn't second nature when God becomes first. It becomes first nature. And so important for us to look at life and understand that God's wanting to take us to the knowledge of who you are, the knowledge of who he is, the knowledge of what his plan is all about, the knowledge of how to win in life while you're here on the planet, the knowledge of what God's will is for each and every one of us. And he wants that to be part of our life in a called epinosis, where it actually becomes part of our life. It's something we don't just do. It's something that we do because it's part of us. And what we do over the years, we do a lot of things that never really become part of us, but there are some things that is just the way we do things. Did you know that you have epinosis knowledge about how you brush your teeth? That most of the time you will brush your teeth exactly the same way as you did the day before. You'll start on the same side, you go to the middle, you go to the other side. You know, if you're smart, you'll floss. Uh, some of you need to floss with ropes. And, uh, but nevertheless, you floss. And, uh, you know, you do the same thing, the same routines all the time. Why? Because it's ingrained inside you. It's become part of your life on how you do things. You tie shoes exactly the same way. If you're tying a shoe, you will tie it exactly the same way, sit in the same position. Why? Because it's become part of your life. And when God's word becomes that entrenched inside of you, it's called epinosis. And so what we've been doing is getting epinosis, the living knowledge of direction in the inside of you. Why? So you can get the right direction on how to do life. Why? So that you can end up at the right place. Why? So that you can get blessed because if you're in the wrong place, God can't bless you. And he can't bless you because he loves you too much to bless you when you're in the wrong place because you'll stay in the wrong place. You've heard me say that over and over. Tonight, Seeking God for a Sound Direction is the title of the message. Of course, there's just no easy formula in seeking God, and there's, there's no easy formula in getting sound, if you will, direction from God. There's lots of things you can do, and maybe you only have to do a few of them in order for them to be active in your life. But these are a few for you to consider. I want to take you, if I may, this night to Genesis in the 24th chapter as we look at a, a wonderful little subject. You know, everything in the Old Testament is there for a reason. There's stories that tell about physical activity in the Old Testament so that it can be translated for you and I in the New Testament as spiritual principles. So when you look at something in the Old Testament, it's not just there as a common story. It's not just there for a Sunday school lesson, like so many people think. It's there so that you get a spiritual principle out of it, understand it to the place where it becomes epinosis on how to live the life that you know you need to live and do so that you can be the one that God's going to bless. You've been around people all your life. Some are so blessed and some aren't blessed at all, all of which call themselves Christians. Why do some Christians get blessed and other Christians don't get blessed? I mean, could there be a possible formula in the Word of God, the hidden mysteries of God, that if you learn it to the place of epinosis, not just gnosis, and apply it in your life, man, it sets you free in every area of your life because the truth shall do what? Make you what? Free. And so the word of God comes along and 
gives us great truth on how to live life. That's what I love about when we come in here and sing, come in here and dance, and come in here and have a lot of fun laughing at each other and, you know, just kind of kick back and enjoy Bible study. But the best part about, I think, this church is it always gets down to trying to develop the heart in hypnosis. Because when epinosis takes place, life changes. When your marriage is now carried through because the word of God is alive on the inside of you, and the husband responds to the wife because of the word, not because of what the wife did or didn't do, and the wife responds to the husband because of the word, epinosis is alive on the inside, all of a sudden, bad marriages become good marriages. It's the same thing with every principle in the word of the Lord. In the Old Testament, there's a story. And of course, you know about Abraham, and Abraham had a son of the promise. His name was Isaac. Isaac was older now, and Isaac was in need of a wife. And um, it's really fascinating how they set up wives in those days. And, and um, so the dad, Abraham, makes arrangements for someone to go find a wife for his son. Um, I, I don't know if that's good or bad or whatever. That's not here nor what the discussion's about. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting that many of those types of marriages worked out wonderfully. And that just shows the wisdom of God. And so here we find in the 24th chapter of Genesis a story, if you will, of Abraham, Isaac, his son, the desire of Abraham for his servant to go and find Isaac, his son, a wife. Now, I bring this to you because through this is the development of direction. The one who's going to find the wife has got to absolutely run the process in order to get the direction from God to get to the right place to know who it is that is the right person for the son Isaac. And he is a responsible leader. He is actually a servant of Abraham who's going to go find Isaac's wife. But he's more than a servant. He's like the administrator of all the assets, if you will, of Abraham. Abraham is wealthy. God has prospered him. God has made him a very wealthy person. He has sheep and cattle and he has he has all kinds of uh, silver and gold and servants and he's catered to in every area and God's blessing and promises upon Abraham in a mighty way. And yet he's lacking something. He knows there's a very important part of his son's life that has to be complete by the right person. Have you ever been in a place in your life where you know that something has to get done and it has to get done by the right person, has to get done by the right way, it has to be, this is a very important issue whether you're running a business or whether you're just thinking about getting married or going to school or whatever it is that you're in. Maybe you're at that place in your life where inside you, you know you need to have the right people in the right places. You know you need to get the right direction in order to have the right outcome. Without the right direction, you don't have the right outcome. Without the right outcome, you don't get blessed. Does anybody listen? He knows that, and he knows how important it is. I'll read you, if I may, on the first verse. It says, now Abraham was old, well advanced in age. Circle that and say, Pastor Jim's age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. I, you know, when the comment comes and it says where the Lord had blessed him in all things, trust me, my friends, I mean, he was blessed in all things. Because God didn't make a statement like that without following up. This man in every area of his life, listen to this, let me tell you something. His family, his marriage, his business, relatives, relationship with God, every area of his life. You know, if anything, when you read verse number one, you and I ought to get excited because God's not a respecter of persons. And if God blesses Abraham in all things, then God also, who loves you just as much, but not anymore, than Abraham wants to bless you in all things. 
And so the whole entire book is about how to get God to get you to the right place so that God can bless you in all things. Verse number two, so Abraham said to his oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had. Now, this guy wasn't just anybody. He ruled over everything. He was the administrator of all that Abraham had. So he was very trusted man. This shows, number one, if you're going to get direction, you don't get direction from some slouch. You ought to make a little note next to that. He didn't select just any one of his servants. He actually desired to get something very important done in his life, and if he's going to get something very important done in his life, he's going to get the very best to get it done in his life. Sometimes we just settle for whatever. And God is looking for a people that will be wise enough like Abraham to say, something's very important in my life. I don't know, maybe it's your business, maybe it's your family, maybe it's your children. Whatever it is, you've got to get the right advice. You've got to get the right person to help you carry through with it. If you hook up with the wrong person, it won't ever get done. So here he is in verse number two, hooking up with the right person. Man, it just says so much. In verse number two, he says, he's, he's the guy that's over all. He says, please put your hand under my thigh. And what this is, is a tradition in those days to say that the thigh is the part of the body where all the power of that body comes from. If you've ever seen a football player on the field, you'll see that his, he's, he's maneuvering on his toes and everything, but the thigh, or a tennis player, it's always in the thigh. The thigh is what gives him the power to go from here to there. So him putting his hand underneath his thigh is saying, I'm hooked onto you by the side, and what you have is mine, and your power, and now I'm in an agreement with your power. So this is just not just a statement that says there. He says, listen, I'm expecting something from you. I'm giving you everything that you need to do to get the job done. Isn't that just like God to give us everything we need to do to get the job done? Sometimes we, listen to this, get direction from some other source other than the one who has his hand underneath our thigh. Yeah. Is anybody listening? We're always looking for somebody to tell us something and help us when, when in fact it's God himself. And it comes along, and that's only verse one and verse number two. And that's how they, you know, how men today shake hands. And th that day when a, an agreement was made, the hand went under the thigh said that your power is my power and I understand that we're hooked together at the hip. Kind of fascinating, huh? Verse number three, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. One of the things that's fascinating about obtaining direction for important events in our life is that you cannot get direction from somebody who is ungodly and expect to prosper. It just doesn't work. I, I refuse to be in any form of partnership of any kind in any of my businesses that all, oh, in fact, I don't have any partners, but except Deborah, I mean, I know she turned on. But you see, here he makes a statement, and it's a great statement. He says, listen, I want you to swear that you're not going to find a wife in the land of Canaan, these unbelievers, these people who have no God. In other words, it's very important that my son have a future. Now translate that. It's very important that your business works. It's very important that your children grow to serve the Lord. It's very important that your marriage works. It's very important for your, your witness upon the earth. It's very important for you to be who God's called you to be. Now, if you mix who you are and what you want with something from the outside, it isn't going to work. And Abraham is smart enough to realize in this verse number three, listen, I'm making you swear that you do not find my son, a, a daughter of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. He says, I live in this land. I know the people. And yes, maybe they're pretty. And yes, maybe they're smart. And yes, they may be wealthy. And yes, they may have lands and farms and, and groves and, and, and vineyards and fields and flocks. But no way are you going to let your son 
my son who has a future with God be mingled with something that is not of God. New Testament says it like this. What in the world have you got to do with that which is evil? Unequally yoked. And I'm not talking about just marriage. I'm talking about business. I'm talking about life. I'm talking about just where, well, watch this, where you get your direction from. If you're a Christian getting direction from some other source other than God, you are unequally yoked and you will not prosper. And Abraham knew that, my friends. And sometimes what we do is we listen to worldly advice and we listen to worldly ways and, and we think, wow, that might, let me tell you something. If God doesn't speak his word about it, I'm not listening to nothing about it. I don't do business the way the world does business. I do business the way God tells me to do business. My formula for success is not what I think. The formula for success is not what people tell me or what politicians or whether or not the market is timed right. The formula for success is when God puts his own business on it. Perfect example of that was Isaac himself. He sowed in a famine. A famine year means there's no sowing means you put seed in the ground. A famine year means there's no rain whatsoever. Nobody sows in a famine year because there's no rain. He can't get a harvest out of it. But God led Isaac and therefore blessed his hand. And the Bible says he got a hundredfold return. In other words, when everybody else failed, Isaac was successful. Why? Because his partner wasn't a Canaanite or a worldly person. His partner was somebody from God that followed the principles of the Lord. And you know something, can I just say something? I'll bet you half or three quarters of you married people that, you know what I'm talking about if you've done, you married somebody who's ungodly. Oh, they're cute, oh, they're fun, all your girlfriends said they were great, and all your boyfriends said they were wonderful, oh, that man is great, oh, I'll just marry that person, I just, everything will be good after I marry him. And then you find out, oh my God. I married Dracula's daughter. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? The son of the devil sleeps in my bed. You're laughing because you know what I'm talking about. And see, what happens is you got direction from the wrong place. And you ended up devastated, brokenhearted, defeated, and everything else. And here's exactly what takes place with, with Abraham. It starts right off. He says, you've got to promise me. I'm not just letting you... You know, you got to swear by the God who created the heavens and the earth. That's how important it was to Abraham to make sure he were flowing in the same spirit. Very important. Without it, it doesn't work, my friends. Verse number, what are we in, four? But you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac's, verse number four, verse number five. And the servant said to to him, perhaps the woman will not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I take your son back to the land from which you come? And Abraham said to him, beware that you do not take my son back there. The Lord God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my family, and who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, to your descendants I will give this land. In other words, he knew where his blessings are. And sometimes we don't know that. Sometimes we think it doesn't really matter. And he's making a statement. Listen, if... The woman doesn't come when you find her and she doesn't want to come to my son. You do not take my son back to her. My son belongs in this land. Why? Because God said this is where we're to be. And sometimes we circumvent what God says to get what we want. And you cannot circumvent what God says to get what you and I want because we will fail if we do. So he makes a statement. No matter if the woman doesn't want to come or not, do not remove my son from the land. God brought me to this land so that my descendants would get blessed. And by the way, in case you didn't know it, if you're born of the Spirit of God, New Testament now, you are a descendant of Abraham. And the important thing here is for us to see that you can't go get the blessings. The blessings are going to come to you. Because sometimes when you go where you think the blessings are, they're not there. 
and you're trying to make the blessing happen. If it's a blessing from God, it'll come to you. That's what God does is he brings you to the place of blessing. Does anybody listen? You don't have to chase after the blessing. You have to chase after God and the blessings will come. Are you following me? And so what we do all the time is we miss that in such an amazing simple principle. It goes on in verse number seven. I think verse number seven really starts to pop with information. The first part we just talked about is okay, but this now it gets wild. Are you ready? In verse number seven, he says, uh, to the descendant I give this land. He will send his angel before you that you shall take a wife for my son from there. Now, wait a minute. He's telling his servant, who is his administrator of his finances, so you know he's not a flake. He is the guy that makes decisions over his flocks, over his vineyards, over his herds. He's running one of the greatest economic organizations of the time, and this is the number one guy, and he just said to the number one guy, there's an angel gonna lead you. I don't know if that even tricks you at all, but blows me away. Sometimes we forget about how important it is to look for the supernatural. I can't imagine a people being born of the Spirit of God, having a supernatural God, and getting directions from something that is not supernatural, expecting supernatural results. Did I get Pentecostal enough for you? In other words, listen to what I'm saying. How is it that we who are supernaturally born of the Spirit of God go somewhere other than a supernatural God and expect natural results are natural directions that gives us supernatural results? Doesn't make sense. You have got to condition yourself to weird things. I mean, bottom line. I mean, some people have no problem with weird. Have you ever been around them in church? I mean, they're just a like flat weird. And I always say, fine, as long as you're quiet, you can be weird here. You get too weird, I'll throw you out. The whole deal here is that here comes Abraham and he says to his servant, the angel is gonna go before you and he'll take a wife for my son from there. My goodness. In other words, if I'm expecting supernatural results, don't you think I ought to look for the supernatural and not be afraid of the supernatural? I mean, think about it just for a moment. Now, if I'm looking for natural results, give me the San Bernardino sun. Give me, if you will, the, you know, uh, newspapers that tell me about stock markets. But if I'm looking for supernatural results, then I have got to go to the source of that which is supernatural. And he, he tells them right off the bat, listen, there's something weird going to take place. An angel's going to go before you and open up the door for you in such a way that it's, you're going to find a wife there in that land. I want you to just hold your place there and go with me to Nehemiah, the ninth chapter. And Nehemiah, by the way, if you don't know where Nehemiah is, it's in your Bible. It just kind of thumb through the back towards Job. And, and when you get to Job, you've gone too far. If you, if you found Esther, you've gone too far. And if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're right there, if you will, uh, next to Esther, in front of Esther is Nehemiah 9th chapter. Nehemiah 9th chapter. There's this interesting verse. Let me see if I, I, I have it for you in verse... In verse number, I don't know if I have 20. I'll read 20, but I'll go to 21. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them. Notice the instructions come from the what? Spirit. That's weird. 
that did not withhold your manna from their mouth. In other words, this is the children of Israel that are caught in the wilderness. And right off the bat, he starts to deal with them in a supernatural, super spiritual, beyond the natural way. Verse number 21. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out. Their feet did not swell. That doesn't make sense. But in order for them to be existing for 40 years in the wilderness, God had to feed them every day with manna. That's the weirdest thing in the world. It fell out of the sky. They could only collect it for that one day. Couldn't collect it for any longer than that one day. And the weirdest part of the whole thing, then it comes along and says this. Listen to this. You want supernatural results? Your clothes don't even wear out. Listen to these words. He says, you lacked absolutely nothing and your feet did not even swell up. And they walked day and night. I mean, to me, that's just bizarre. Absolutely, completely bizarre. And so I find myself oftentimes not looking for what I should be looking for. If I go back to verse number 19, it says this in the ninth chapter. Yet in your manifold mercies, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on a road, nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way that they should go. In other words, they were getting direction from God in a supernatural way. A cloud cover by day that kept them cool and as they moved by night, they needed a light. They didn't have any lights like you and I have. They didn't have any street lights whatsoever. It was dark out there. So God gets a pillar of flame, a fire that goes and follows them for 40 years, my friend. If you want supernatural results, you can't stay in the natural. You're gonna have to get over to the weird side that says an angel, if he has to, will help me, or God will drop food out of heaven to take care of me, and I don't know how it's gonna work, but I'll tell you what, my clothes won't even wear out. God will make a way for me. You gotta get there. It's not easy. It's not easy, and then still try to stay sane so the world around you doesn't think you're gone idiot. And they don't listen to you anymore. Verse number eight, go back with me if you will, Genesis 24. And if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be released from this oath. Only, again, do not take my son back there. No, isn't it interesting? He wanted the wife from there, but he didn't want his son there. You know why? because where he was now is where God is. Back there, there's no God. Those people have no God. I'll take the wife from there, but I won't take the no God position. Interesting. Verse number nine. So the servant put his hand under his thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took 10 of his master's camels and departed, for all the master's goods were in his hands, and he arose and he went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. Now I want you just to circle the name Nahor right there, if you would. See where I highlighted up on the overhead screen, to the city of Nahor. A lot of people don't understand that that is the city that's named after the family of Abraham. That would be like if this city was named after, well, let's don't use this city. Uh, Beverly Hills was named after, instead of being called Beverly Hills, called Jim Gilbray. That's why I didn't do San Bernardino, you know what I mean? If I'm gonna give you an illustration, let me give you a good illustration. Uh, so, you know, so, uh, I mean, this, his city is named after his family. That's pretty amazing, pretty wealthy, pretty rich, and yet he left it for God, which is an interesting thing. No wonder God blessed him in everything. You and I are gonna be called by God 
oftentimes to leave the stuff of the world behind and let God supply us. And then from there, God will build in our lives. Are you listening to me? And give us directions. Verse number 11, and he made the camels kneel down outside the city as a well of water at the evening time, the time when women come out to draw water. So here is all these 10 camels on their knees. It's fascinating what takes place. Then he said, one translation says it like this in verse number 12, then he prayed. If you and I are ever going to get direction from God, it doesn't come because you're pretty smart, talented, or gifted. Direction from God comes because you are in a relationship with God where God speaks to you, oftentimes because you speak to him. I need, like I said last Sunday night, I need to hear from God more than God needs to hear from me. In order to get it. Now I'm not saying don't pray. Here you see this man. This is now the servant and he is now praying. So if you're going to get direction, even though he got direction from his master, he is something else. He is going beyond his master Abraham and now he's going to God Almighty himself and saying, God, here I am with amazing responsibility and I don't know what to do. I need your help. Have you ever been in a place where you don't know what to do and you need God's help? Let me tell you something. First place to start is in prayer. Because without prayer, it doesn't work. Very important for all of us. He starts to pray. Oh, Lord God, of my master Abraham. <laughs> I had to laugh at that. I mean, the guy, he doesn't even say, Oh, Lord God, my heavenly father, like you and I can say. Listen to the relationship he has with God. He does not have a relationship where he's called the child of God. He does not have a relationship where his sins have been washed by the blood of the Lord, that you have been adopted into the family of God. When you made Jesus Lord of your life, you are part of the inheritance. You are part of, you are king's kids. This guy is going to pray and get results from God when he doesn't even know that God even knows who he is. In fact, listen to the prayer. I love this. And he, he says this words, Oh Lord God of my master Abraham, please give me success this day. If he can ask for it, let me say it again. I think you're getting it. If he can ask for it, <laughs> this is a guy who doesn't have a relationship with God. Only has a relationship with God through his master. Give me success this day and show kindness to my master's master Abraham. Behold, here I stand by the water well and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now, let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please let down your pitcher that I, I may drink. And she says, drink and I will even give your camels a drink. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant, Isaac. And by this, I will know. By this, I will know. By this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Can I just say something here? Challenging God is always not good strategy. I heard it said one time, lay out a fleece before God and you'll get fleeced. In this particular case, he gets away with it. But with you, with the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as a child of God, should not go and lay out fleeces before the Lord. Lord, if this happens, I, I, I'll know it's you. Guess what? The devil will make it happen. And it won't be God at all, and you will end up the loser. Why? Because that's not how you approach God. It says, come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy in a time of need and find grace. My goodness sakes alive. We're to boldly come, not just, oh God, if this works, I'll know it's you. If this, but he gets away with it because God's merciful. God loves him. 
But for us that are in the new kingdom and the kingdom of God in the New Testament, we have a different relationship with God. And I don't think you should challenge God. Verse number 15. And it happened before that he was finishing speaking. Can I just say this? All of a sudden he's speaking and before he even finishes speaking, that behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, son of Micah, Listen to this, wife of Nahor, Abraham's mm, brother, the city's named after Abraham's family, comes out with her pitcher on her shoulder, verse number 16, and says this. Now, the young woman was very beautiful and beyond, uh, and behold, a virgin, no man had known her, and she went down to the well and filled the pitcher and came up. Can I just say something? I want to stop you right there. Not everything that looks good is God. Not everything that looks good is God. I'm going to put up a verse for you. James, first chapter, verse 17. Make a note of this. Listen to this. It says this. Every good gift and perfect gift is from above. It may look good, but if it's not perfect, it's not God. Listen, the cross looked horrible, and it was perfect. So you can't go by looks. But if you want to know if it's from God or not, it's not because she looked good. That's just making a statement. She looks good. Oh, boy, Isaac's going to be happy. But here's the deal. Sometimes what you're asking for may not look so good, but it's perfect from God. And that's the best part of knowing who God is. It's finding out, backing off, understanding. We move so much in the flesh that if it looks good, we think it's God. Hear me, just because it looks good doesn't mean it's God. Every good and perfect gift, something can look good, not be perfect. I really believe the devil can manufacture good, but cannot manufacture perfect. Because there's no perfection in him. He's tainted. Are you following? So here's this good looking woman, verse number 17. And the servant ran to meet her. Please, let me have a little drink of water from your pitcher. And she said to him, drink my Lord. Oh boy, little that's number one, that's good. Then she quickly let her pitcher down in her hand and gave him a drink. And when she, had, when, when she had finished giving him a drink, she said that I may draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. In other words, she's gonna sit there. This woman's a special lady. Then she quickly, listen to this, emptied her pitcher into the trough, ran back to the well and drew water and drew for all of the camels. And the man, now here's the deal. Right here, stop right there. He asked her for this. He got that. I would have, and so would you, been jumping around. Yeah, this is the one. Ha <laughs> ha, whoa, this is cool. Man, she's it. That's perfect. What great answers. I just prayed, got great answers. This is wonderful. Ha 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 ha. Thank you, Lord. This is great. He doesn't do that. Verse 17. In order for us to understand how to get direction, when you see something that is obvious, take your time. One of the neatest verses right here is verse number 21. And the man wondered at her like, <gasps> that's what wondering is. Did you get it? Here, I'll do it again for this side. <sighs> But listen to the next part of the verse. I love this. Remained silent. Shut up. Not everything that's good is God. Don't start jumping for joy when you see it. Take your time. The one thing God can't counterfeit, or the devil can't counterfeit, is that God is in no hurry. 
And he is always in a hurry trying to get people to act fast. I love people that send me things. If you don't act on this in two days, it isn't going to work. You've got to call right now. It's limited. I say, fine, then let it go. If it's not God, I don't want it anyway. And if it's fast, I can almost guarantee you it's not God because God's not in a hurry. And I've said this to you before. I want to say it to all those of you that are new again. God is not moved by time. Time moves God. If God was moved by time, then time would be the superior force over God instead of God being the superior one over time. Therefore, God is never in a hurry. And I love this verse, verse number 21, and he was silent. So as to know, silent, as to know, when something comes your way that's direction, it'll be God's direction tomorrow, the next week, next month. Give it time and let God work it out for you before you make a move on it. Because if God wants you to do it, then you will know whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. Anyway, Food for thought tonight. If God spoke to you about something, give the Lord a great big praise. You know that? <laughs> you know, there's some of you that are in here, I don't want to wait until the end of the service. You, God spoke to me and said, you are ready right now to get right with God and give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. Who am I talking to? I'm talking to somebody who hasn't yet given God all of their heart and all of their life. You know who God is in your head. You celebrate Christmas, you celebrate Easter. You even think of yourself as a Christian. But you're not. You don't live for him. He's something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not against him, but watch this. You're not wholehearted for him. And the truth is, that adds up to that you're really not born again. Because the way to get born again is you've got to give God all of your heart. You've got to give God all of your life. It's not just mental ascension towards him. It's not just mental agreement about him. Even the devil knows who he is, and he's not going to heaven. So us having mental agreement or mental ascension towards him doesn't get us to heaven. What gets us to heaven, Jesus says in John 3rd chapter, that you must be born again. Now he makes a statement. He says, no man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get there your way is what he just said. You can't get there my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. Uh-uh. In order for you to get to heaven, you're going to have to get to heaven his way. And what's been holding you back with God is you have to make the step to give God all of your heart and all of your life. That's what Jesus did with you. He walked the streets of Calvary, the Son of God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, who holds it all together by the power of his might, a beaten, bloody mess, chose to give you all of his heart, didn't hold anything back, chose to give you all of his life, didn't hold anything back. And those that would hold back, according to the scripture, New Testament, you're just not gonna be worthy for the kingdom of God. And tonight, here's an invitation, because you know I'm talking to you, to give God once and for all, all of your heart and all of your life. That's right, here you are in this safe, friendly place. We've laughed and clapped and had a good time shouting and singing. In a moment, we'll hear the word of God, but why wait any longer? You know it's you. Here's what I want you to do. I don't want anybody to clap. I don't want anybody to do anything. If you're serious about God, about getting right with God, I'm serious about loving you enough, respecting you enough, and honoring you enough to tell you the truth, that you need to give God all of your heart and all of your life. In order to do that, let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. That's what Jesus said. So in a moment, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna to count to three, I'll go like this. One, two, three, and then I'm gonna bang on this, on this Bible. I'll go one, two, three, go. When you hear that sound, bang, your hand goes up. All you're saying by the raise of your hand is, I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. 
I want to give God all of my heart and give God all my life. I don't want to have just mental ascension towards Jesus. I want to, I want to give him everything like he gave me. I want to be born again just like he said I needed to be. I'll see your hand go up and you can put it right back down. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, hold on. That will embarrass me. Yep, it will. Get over it. It's better to be embarrassed for a moment in a safe place like this, isn't it? Than to be in hell forever and ever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. Come on, no one's that dumb. No one. And tonight is your night. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're saying, I've never given him all of my life. I, you know, I want him to be in my life, but I want to control my life. I haven't really given him over to him. I still do my own thing instead of his thing. Then I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. Or if maybe if you're just one of those people that are just not sure, you need to make sure tonight the Spirit of God is in this house, hovering in this home. You know, the Bible says no one comes to the Lord except by the Spirit of God. By the Spirit. Let the Spirit of God draw you. If you need to get your hand up when I hit my Bible, then get it up and then let me see it. Because he said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see it. And then put it right back down. It's that simple. Is that okay? All across this auditorium, back to the family rooms, wherever you're at, I'm going to count to three right now. And let's don't go another moment without God. Let's don't play this church thing, religion stuff. Let's just get really right with God by giving him all of our heart and giving him all of our life. I'm counting to three. Your call, your choice. I've done my job. Now you need to respond and forget about whether the people next to you respond or don't respond. It's you and you and God alone right now all across this auditorium. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Thank you. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. Thank you. Back here. Eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five. Thank you. Back on top over there. Twenty-six. Thank you. God bless you. Put your hand on. I saw it. There's twenty-six. Where are you? Twenty-seven. You didn't get your hand up, but you should have, and you know it. There's 26, there's 27, thank you. Where are you, 28? 28, anybody else, anybody else? Anybody else, real quick, you know you need to get your hand up. Don't miss this opportunity. I didn't embarrass them, I won't embarrass you. Anybody else, there's 27. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 27. <laughs> Hallelujah. Isn't God good? <laughs> God is so good. Here's what I want you to do. All 27 of you, mm, even 28, 29, 30, you didn't get your hand up, but you know you should have. Little rascals. But all 27 of you, if you're serious, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible. Get a friend. Bring a friend if you need to. Why don't you get out of your seat. Come right up here in front. We want to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. Get your stuff. Bring a friend if you need to. Get out of your seat and get up here. If you if you raise your hand, get up here right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. If you raise your hand, you're serious. Come on. Get up here. so good. Oh, thank God you all have come. Hey, listen, put a smile on your face. You're not going to the morgue. You're going to heaven. <laughs> this is a good thing. You know, 
not a bad thing, <laughs> you know. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to look to your left. See this guy waving at you, his name's Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a good guy. He wants to pray with you, give you some free stuff, tell you about a program we have that'll help you get strong. We don't want you just to pray, go to heaven, and be beat up while you're here on earth as a Christian. We want to help you get strong as a Christian. So when the devil comes knocking at your door, and I promise you he will, you can say, hey, just go to hell. I'm not going there with you, you know? Now, I didn't swear. Hell is for him and not for you. <laughs> is that good? Okay, it only takes a few moments to let you come right back in church service. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.